From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. Hello, everyone. I'm Curtis Fuller, and welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. Coming up on the show today, I'll have an interview with one of Cincinnati's well-known photographers, Michael Mitchell. He has taken some iconic pictures for more than 50 years. Plus, an interview with longtime educator Dr. Cleester Mims. You'll hear part of her fascinating journey, as she says, from the cotton fields to college. Also, the ongoing effort by community advocates in the fight against HIV AIDS. But first, taking entrepreneurship to a whole new level, the work by the local group Mortar that is changing lives and changing communities. We're planning on opening in May of 2024, which ironically is also our 10 year anniversary is in May of 24. So uh, looking at this journey of what the last 10 years has meant to Mortar and what it will continue to mean to Mortar, to Cincinnati and specifically to Walnut Hills is something I'm really excited about. That's Alan Woods, the CEO and co-founder of the organization Mortar, talking about an exciting project being developed, a new multi-million dollar headquarters coming to Walnut Hills to benefit underserved entrepreneurs and small businesses. First of all, tell people what Mortar means and where that came from. Yeah, for us, Mortar is an entrepreneurship accelerator that's based here in Cincinnati. Uh, we started here in Cincinnati almost 10 years ago, and we really represent what it means to hold a community together. So for us, when we say Mortar, we talk about the things that really hold a community together, and it's not the buildings, it's the people. And so when we started our accelerator, we wanted to make sure that we were catering specifically to black entrepreneurs in our communities who are looking to start or scale their businesses. I remember when you first told me about this, when you first moved to town yeah. with your wife, um, and I thought, wow, that sounds like a great idea. But I must tell you, I never imagined that it would blossom into what it has become in, in such a short period of time. Everybody has embraced it. Uh, your response to your success in 10 years? Same response. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm blown away. Like every, every day that I think about the magnitude of the impact that we've had, we started this program specifically in Over the Rhine. That was supposed to be the only place we did the program. Uh, and then we got invited to Walnut Hills. Then we got invited to College Hill. The next thing you know, we started doing this program around the country. So we have actually had a footprint in 10 different cities around the country, as far west as Seattle, as far south as Galveston. We've had over 440 grad was just here in Cincinnati alone. Uh, we have a fund where we help to give entrepreneurs uh, resources to help them through that process. So if they're a graduate from our program, they're eligible for that. And as of next year, we'll cross the, the million dollar mark. So we're at $940,000 that we put right back into the hands of our entrepreneurs. So I'm blown away. The, this building yeah. <laughs> that I, I, I walked through mm -hmm. uh, in Walnut Hills, Gilbert Avenue, an old bank building. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, how this all came about. Yeah, um, there's a quote that says, if, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And let's just say that my dreams are real scary right now. Because <laughs> this is something that, again, way bigger than we ever imagined. So to, to have a project that's a multi-million dollar renovation of a building in Walnut Hills, a neighborhood that has embraced mortar, a neighborhood that has embraced my family. We moved to Walnut Hills several years ago. Uh, it is a it's a dream come true to be able to know that we can come together and collaborate and create a space that makes it a safe spot for entrepreneurs of color to come into. So uh, there are a lot of accelerators, there are a lot of co-working spaces, and some of them when you walk in, you just don't feel that community vibe, you know? And so we wanted to create something that really gave people an opportunity to see people who look like them, who were pursuing the same things, have the same goals, and this space will give us that opportunity to do that right in the community of Walnut Hills. So we're, we're excited. What was the spark in you 
to take you to the level that you are. I mean, at some point you say, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And you have a passion for it. So wh where did that come from? This is this is my dream job, Curtis. Like this, this was the first opportunity I've had in my life to kind of roll all of the different things that are a part of my passion and my purpose into one thing, you know? So from a background of doing photography, so, you know, being able to tell stories through visuals or through film or um, encouraging entrepreneurs to kind of take their brands to the next level. That's always been something that I've been uh, really inspired by and want to continue to help people to do. And so Mortar gave me that opportunity to do that and to see the stories of Walnut Hills and understand that the stories are not finished. You know, there's a lot of times when people would try to put an end on your story and they'll say, oh, you know, Walnut Hills is done. And people did that in the 70s. And a lot of these buildings closed and a lot of these businesses stopped operating. And now we're seeing that the story was not ended. You know, this there, there was a comma there instead of a period. And so I, I'm just thrilled to be a part of helping Walnut Hills to rewrite the narrative and rewrite what the story looks like in the future. For us, it's, it's always about considering what the future looks like and how we can um, be a part of building that now. And so we, we created an initiative called Future History Now, where in February and March, through Black History Month and Women's History Month, we really talk about what it's like to work today to create the future of tomorrow, you know? And so I think that this initiative helps us to continue to push that narrative of what is future history now and how do we operate today so that when we look back in the history books in the future, we'll say, Mortar put a stamp in, on Walnut Hills, we put a flag in the ground, and we dug our heels in and said, we will be here for this community and we're gonna do what we can to help these entrepreneurs. Welcome back, everyone. According to the CDC, more than one million people are living with HIV in the United States. Cincinnati has been leading the way with an interesting project to help people who could be at high risk for HIV. You have to meet people where they are. And if it means um, having a vending machine out there with condoms, with uh, Narcan and those types of things, maybe, and also literature, HIV prevention literature, then that's what we need to do. An organization called Caracol started a national trend by putting this vending machine at its location in Northside a couple of years ago. Um, we really wanted to provide services in the middle of the pandemic um, that people could feel safe about accessing and people could get the supplies that they needed to stay safe um, throughout the pandemic. So we implemented the harm reduction vending machine. Um, since implementation, we've had over 1,600 people register to use the machine. It is free. Um, a brief registration process where we gather some demographic data, information about what people like from the machine, what they are using, um, and how they use it. And people can access one of each supply once a week. We have provided technical assistance for, at this point, I think it's 72 health departments and agencies across the country who um, utilized kind of our programming and our methods and our data collection to um, put vending machines in their communities. Caracol is an HIV and AIDS advocacy organization that's been around for more than 35 years. When we started out in 1987, we were a small housing agency, basically a non-medical hospice taking care of people as they passed away. And with the changes in medication, um, that changed everything for us in terms of, of our growth as an agency and how we were able to meet the new and emerging needs in the community. Um, because people were living longer, it became, it went from being a fatal disease mostly to a chronic illness. And so that changed how we served people. This health vending machine is stocked with harm reduction products. Everything from safe sex items to Narcan. Often, you know, we're coming back to stigma, but often people don't want to walk into an AIDS service organization. They don't want to talk to someone about HIV, but they're willing to access supplies to keep them safe. While we've made great strides in reducing those deaths, people are still dying. Yeah. And we don't see, and early on in the epidemic, when it first came out, when, when we first became aware of it, we the public, um, people 
were dying literally like flies. I mean, you were going to funerals at least two or three times a week, every week for a long time, until there were strides made, you know, improvements made with the medications. Those who have worked decades being a voice for the AIDS issue will tell you the journey is better, but it's not over. There's not a cure on the horizon. And so I always end stuff until there's a cure. So I'll continue to do this work until there's a cure. Simple as that. Welcome back in here with me is photographer extraordinaire. I tell you, Michael Mitchell uh, celebrating well over 50 years of taking images in greater Cincinnati and really throughout the country. First of all, this is, this is fun to welcome you here. Thank you. And to have this conversation. I've known you a long time. And, I, and recently I said, you know what? We need to come in and talk about some of the stuff that you've done. Yes. Start with what inspired you to go into photography, Michael. Uh, well, as a high school student at Withrow High School, I was in commercial arts, vocational, and we had a photo lab. And I kind of gravitated to taking pictures in high school. And I thought it was much easier than <laughs> illustrating. <laughs> and I, you know, it caught on for yeah. me, you know. And you have taken photos of, I mean, uh, people all over the city, um, stars, mm -hmm. entertainers. Let's, let's just go through a few. Okay. I, I, I want to start with some of the uh, sports athletes. Okay. Uh, Serena, Venus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I should say, when you've taken the, uh, the pictures of Serena mm -hmm. and Venus mm -hmm. and, and Coco, right. uh, you are right there right. on, on uh, court, court yeah, side. court side, yeah. It's a great place to be. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're there in the action, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they, uh, they perform for you. Enter entertainers, uh, you mentioned Michael Jackson. Right. You've taken pictures of Michael Jackson right. and so many others. Right. Little Richard, uh, Little Eva, uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Martha and the Vandellas, Temptations. <laughs> the list is pretty extensive. Is there someone that you've, or is there like a group that you've taken more pictures of than others? Maybe the OJs yeah, uh, shot. Yeah, they've been, shot, to town, yeah, they've so been much, yeah. to town so so many times. And uh, Patty Labelle, of course. Yeah. Uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. There might be a photograph I can look at or, ha or have looked at and say, "Man, I remember how I got that shot." There's a shot of uh, a guy named Lavelle Smith. He was a background uh, uh, dancer for Michael. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to take some shots of him because we was going to do a story on him. But I only had three songs to do it in. <laughs> and the shot that I took of him was a shot of him in the background, but Mike came into the view. So the shot is cropped with Michael's leg mm -hmm. and his, all his buckles. <laughs> <laughs> but Lavelle is right there in the middle. So that was my money shot. Yeah. yeah. And people should know, how, how are you chosen to do what you do? A lot of times, uh, it depends, it's for the magazine or, or when I was with uh, Knit Magazine or with the Cincinnati Herald, uh, you know, I was asked to do, you know, go to those concerts or sporting events. And then I uh, had opportunities to shoot for uh, Warner Brothers, Motown, uh, Electra. I said you've been doing this over 50 years. That's, that's probably hard for you to even <laughs> uh, think of. We have, Cincinnati is blessed because we have some great photographers right. uh, in the city. Uh, I was saying to you earlier, probably the godfathers yeah. or C. Smith and, and Mel. Mel Greer. Right. right? Yeah. Right. Talk a little bit about them and their influence on you. Oh, man. You know, Mel is, is Mount Rushmore, you know. 
Uh, C as well. Uh, Mark uh, Bowman is another guy I have looked up to. David Cole, uh, Michael Keating. Mm -hmm. He's another yeah. guy I've worked alongside of, you know. But male, man, male is male. <laughs> uh, he's just been a great mentor to, for me and uh, for others, I believe. And uh, Jimmy Bowen, yeah. he's another one. Yeah. When I, as I've looked through some of your photos, mm -hmm. I realize how many pictures you've taken of me as, as well. <laughs> I, some of them I didn't even realize existed. Um, uh, the, 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 the politics, you, you've mm -hmm. uh, taken pictures of Barack Obama mm -hmm. and so many others. Talk right. a little bit about some of the political pictures. Uh, those were great opportunities for me. Uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton, uh, Colin Powell, you know, um, well, there, yeah, there is a picture of um, it was during the riots of 2001. Mm -hmm. You take this picture of Harry Belafonte. Yeah. And now that Harry Belafonte yeah. is no longer with us, right. it is just a beautiful yeah. photo of him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was uh, walking, you know, down o uh, over the Rhine with some other uh, people and uh, was happened to be there as well, you know, capturing him. I think I had the opportunity to shoot him about three or four times that he's been here. Uh, you, you also took some photos of um, my uh, friend Fred Shuttlesworth, the great Fred yeah, Shuttlesworth. Yeah, he baptized me, by the fact. Did that yeah, so? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, been a long time friend and, uh, of his uh, church and members of his family is like family with me and uh, photographed him a number of times, right. yeah. And those shots now become iconic now mm. that th these yeah. folks are no longer with right, us. Right, yeah. right. What would you like, final question, what would you like to do with all of this history that you have put together you know, well, through the pictures? Uh, probably a uh, coffee book. I uh, started one years ago, but it, I just wanted to talk about photography. Mm but it transitioned into a biography, which, <laughs> you know, I'm not a writer, so it kind of confused me, so I kind of put it on the back burner. So I would like to pick that back up and uh, perhaps uh, put out something like that. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you. We'll be back in a moment. With me is Dr. Cleester Mims. For those of you longtime Cincinnatians, you are very familiar with her name, longtime educator uh, here in Cincinnati. And first of all, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I am going to take you back <laughs> to Enterprise, Alabama, where it all began, began. long before uh, you came to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this journey. And I, I know we won't be able to tell it all, Okay. But tell us the, that journey from Enterprise, Alabama, to mm -hmm. becoming Dr. Cleaster Mims here in okay. Cincinnati. Well, it's a long journey. My beginning career, <laughs> starting in Enterprise, Alabama, was in the cotton field. And, see, and I, my final career was in the college. <laughs> so that's the journey. Well, well so. and, that's, and that's why I wanted to, you to share some of that because it's, a, it's overcoming so many things. I mean, you, you think 1930 to now. If you were educated at all, you had to go into black businesses, black schools, black everything, because you were not accepted for work in the white community doing Jim Crow. Your work here in Cincinnati is renowned, uh, respected, um, years in education, and then you start your own school. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how uh, your, your, your journey in education now here in Cincinnati. Well, I would have to preface that with just coming in in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, I met my husband in 50, 1954. We were married in 1956. We had our son in 
the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So while I was raising him, I returned to college at Xavier University. And I graduated from Xavier University with my bachelor's degree in 1971. And uh, I started teaching at Stowe Adult Center from Porter and through on to Western Hills through the 80s. And so in the 90s is when I started the school right. in Mar Mar the Marva College Prep School. College. Prep school yeah. uh, first school in the, in the nation. And one of the reasons... And for those who don't know who Marva Collins is, uh, it's not talked about as much as it, as it was because, maybe mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Right. Marva Collins, a uh, well-known educator out of Chicago. Chicago, right. And who had started uh, a focused school on young black children, right. mm -hmm. really teaching them values in addition to their ABCs, teaching them history yeah, right. in addition Just to their ABCs. And yeah. so when, when you announced that you were going to start a school here, mm -hmm. similar to that, right. uh, that was revolutionary in the early Oh 90s. yes, it was. Uh, Mara Collins came here first in order to try to influence Cincinnati Public Schools uh, with her method of phonics that she was teaching. And of course, that was rejected. And we went to lunch, and we were talking about education in general. And uh, the gentleman, named, his name was Beatty, that uh, had brought her here, he said that Mrs. Collins, she teaches just like you, because he and I were <laughs> colleagues at Western Hills High School. And then she replied that, if you want a school, just start your own school. Mm -hmm. So you are celebrating your 90th birthday. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is just amazing. Um, you're, you're, um, you're, you're amazing at 90. There's going to be a big celebration, a community celebration Yes. for you, December 15th. They came to me and wanted to give me a birthday party and I told them that it would be for a purpose. So it's being held at the Marriott out in um, Shannonville uh, and it is really a fundraiser. And uh, because in my life I didn't, I don't need anything materially. I was not um, eager I always wanted to do, I put it this way, I always wanted to do something, whatever I did, to have a higher purpose in doing it. She really is an amazing person. I've known her a long time. Again, that is the Delta Marriott Hotel, Friday, December 15th at 6 o'clock. Come out and join us. We're going to have a lot of fun. Well, that does it for the program today. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time for another edition of Let's Talk Sensing.